We've been in this series, like you heard, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Because the fruit of the Spirit truly embody these virtues that display for us the character of Jesus. And, And when this fruit is on display in our life, when this fruit is being cultivated and growing in our life, then we are going to be more like Jesus. And and as we wrap up this series, I want to talk about a fruit that we don't like to talk about, right? Probably the least popular of all the fruit, right? We got love. Yeah, I love love. Joy. We love love. Joy is awesome. Peace is great. But at the end of the list, you find this one, self-control. Yeah, people are already whispering it. I heard you. You knew. You knew. He's going to talk about self-control. Here we go. I got to put those Twinkies away now. Okay, so... (laughs) We're talking today about self-control, self-control, and what this looks like for us and how this helps us to be more like Jesus. I cannot talk about self-control without introducing you to my little friend. This is my buddy. Check him out. Yeah, there you go. There are two groups of people in the room right now, all right? There's a group of people who's thinking to yourself, Oh, how cute. Sebastian. Is Sebastian a crab? What is Sebastian? Is that a crab? Good. Okay, Sebastian, oh, so cute. There's another group of people in the room. I'm in the second group of people, and the second group of people is thinking right now, mm, oh my gosh. Can you imagine soft shell crab, just deep fried, put it on a sandwich, some spicy mayo. If you're like me, ooh, some crab curry. I mean, just like spicy crab curry, like clear out your sinuses, spicy crab curry, like, ooh. That's what I'm thinking. There's a whole group of people like that. Yeah, I'm, I can see how many people are in which group. All right, we're, we're a majority second group people, apparently. <laughs> so when we talk about self-control, We've got to talk about this guy that I found out about this week named Dan Blumberg. He is such a fascinating dude. I learned about him uh, in an episode of This American Life on NPR, episode number 462. I encourage you to go and listen to it because he is so fascinating. Dan Blumberg gets on NPR because one day he walked into work and his face was so swollen, his eyelids are almost swollen shut, he looks like a blowfish, and his coworkers are all like, dude, like, what happened to you? What is wrong? You need to go to the hospital now. Something's going on. He's like, it's okay. I just ate some crab last night, and I'm really allergic to crab. They're like, you don't seem like you're okay, so we should do something. And his response to his coworkers is, it's not a big deal. Like, one out of every three times that I eat crab, this happens to me. Don't worry about it. Now, you would think this would be like a wake-up call, and it is kind of a wake-up call for him, but in this way. Ira Glass is interviewing him, and this is what he says. He's like, so now what I do, when I go to the restaurant, I take like some Benadryl right before I go. That kind of helps things go better. I make sure I have my inhaler in case my lungs close up, and I have an EpiPen in case I go into anaphylactic shock. Like, that's this guy's mind. That's how he's thinking. He's like, I'll be okay as long as I take care of myself. So these are quotes. I'm going to read you quotes from an interview, things that this guy actually said. Dan says, But the poisoning myself, it's not really that bad. Like I said, I get a little sleepy from the Benadryl, and that's the worst part. I just get really tired. To which Ira Glass responds, but if you find yourself saying the sentence, the poisoning myself is not that bad, Dan interjects, yeah, I mean, I think there's probably something to that. But you know, I like it. What can I say? What can I say? That's Dan. Now, we hear that story, and I hope all of you across the room are thinking, what an idiot, right? Like, are you serious? Like, is this a real human being that is living this way? We think that. You thought you used to like crab. Man, you don't like it as much as Dan likes crab, right? Dan loves crab. But let's be honest. In a lot of ways, all of us are all too familiar with this pattern of thinking and with living our lives this way. I get it for you. It might not be crab or lobster, but there are things in our life that are sabotaging us. There are things in our life that are poisoning us. There are things in our life that we know are leading us towards destruction, And we find ourselves continually giving ourselves over to those things. Do you see that? 
We find ourselves in these patterns. We find ourselves constantly ending up back in the ER, a little bit embarrassed, a little bit like, doctor, I need help again, because here I am again, and it's the same thing over and over and over again. We are somewhat familiar with this pattern of living. And the question that we want to ask today is, how do we overcome this? Like, how do we overcome giving ourselves over to these repeatedly destructive patterns of behavior and habits and addictions in our life? I think we all have this desire in our life to give up those things and to walk away from those things and to experience freedom from those things. How do we do it? So the first week of this series... As we looked at the first part of Galatians 5, where we find the fruit of the Spirit, Paul talks about this freedom that we have in Jesus, right? When you surrender your life to Christ, you're set free. You are declared justified, just as if I'd never sinned. You are made new, and you you enter into that justification. It happens in a moment. We also talked about how we are awaiting the day when we will be glorified, glorification where God makes us truly, completely righteous, where all sin is removed, where hurt and pain and this world and our flesh, like all of those things are removed from us, glorification. But that is when we are with Jesus, that is when Jesus returns, that is after we leave this world. All of us are living in this in-between time. And Paul, throughout Galatians, is talking about what do you do in the in-between? Because in the in-between, we struggle. In the in-between, we, we are dealing with sin. In the in-between, there are habits, there are addictions, there's hurts and hang-ups. There are all of these things that we're walking through. And how do we walk through that from that place of freedom that we have in Jesus. Paul understood this so well. We read this in Romans 7. Think about this. This is the Apostle Paul, right? So so spiritually, let's just say he's doing better than all of us. Let's just make that assumption. But this is what he says. Can you relate to Paul when he says, I don't know what's wrong with me, right? The stuff that I want to do, I don't do. The stuff that I know I should not do, I keep on doing it, right? Like, I am just a miserable wretch who is going to free me from this life of death. And then he goes on to say, I know who's going to do it. Jesus Christ at work in me through the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, we can relate with Paul on this. I think we can all relate with Paul on this. But there's this promise of freedom. So what does it look like to live a life that would be characterized by self-control? We have to understand first what it is not. I'm not talking simply about external behavioral modification. And if you grew up in church, maybe that's the way your church looked at this idea of how to live a life completely devoted to Jesus. Like act a certain way, dress a certain way, you know, don't have tattoos, don't do this, and don't look like that. I'm sorry, tattoos are the only thing that came to mind. Sorry, people with tattoos. We're totally fine with tattoos, okay? But do you know what I'm saying? Like, maybe that's what you heard. This is what it means to follow Christ. Get all the stuff ready on the outside and look a certain way on the inside. Truly honoring Jesus and to be like him in this area of our lives is not about external behavioral modification. It is about internal, spiritual transformation, That's why Jesus is always so upset with the Pharisees as he's living in this world and walking through this world. Man, no one was better at the external behavioral modification than the Pharisees. They knew how to do it, right? No one could look more holy. No one could follow the rules better. No one could trust in their own religious efforts better than the Pharisees. But what does Jesus call them? He he says they are like whitewashed graves. Here's what's going on with you guys. You know how to get everything clean and tidy on the outside, but on the inside, there's nothing but death and rot and decay. To truly follow Jesus, to honor him in this way, means that internally we're being transformed by the Spirit of God growing in likeness to Jesus Christ day in and day out. That's what it takes. So Jesus understood this. The Pharisees, they knew. The Bible says we are supposed to love. And Jesus is like, you know that. And you know to love, but you are not loving people. Are you with me? The Pharisees will say, you know what? We give and we tithe and we do all the things that the Bible says we're supposed to do. And Jesus says, you know to do that, but inside you have not become generous people. Do you see? There is a difference when something changes on the inside of you. That's what we're called to. 
Amen? So here's what Paul says. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Paul says, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want to do. Paul says, there's this battle raging inside of you. There's one part of you that's just like, I want to do whatever I want to do. And he calls that our flesh. We can define our flesh as this sinful inward bent towards self. What I want, my pleasures, what makes me happy, my desires, living for myself, exalting myself, trusting in myself, 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 my flesh. And on the other side of it, he says, the spirit of God with his desires, lives within every believer. And, and these two sides of our lives are in constant conflict, in battle with each other. We're in this fight. The funny thing is even unbelievers grasped this idea of understanding there's something in me that I just don't know. Like there's this stuff that I want that I, I, I shouldn't want. There's these things that I desire that I just don't feel like they're right. Like even unbelievers understood this idea. About 500 years before Paul, there's a guy who lived named Siddhartha Gautama. Some of you might be familiar with, it's the person who became known as the Buddha. But most of his writings and stuff kind of are passed to us through legend. But here's what he felt. He felt like sometimes I just find my mind wandering towards desires and pleasures and things that I should not want. And I do not know how to get those things under control. And he said, fighting those urges within myself is like riding a wild elephant. Now, so you think about where he grew up, where he lived, and that's how he felt it was. Around the same time, Plato. Plato wrote about his life, and he feels like, I feel like my life is this chariot. And the chariot is being pulled by these two horses, right? And both of these horses are just constantly fighting with each other. He writes it like this. He said, one of those horses is a lover of honor with modesty and self-control. The other horse is a companion to wild boasts and indecency. He is wild. He is crazy. He is deaf. Plato's like, he can't hear anything. And he is barely yielding to the whip or to my yells or to my screams or goad combined. I mean, I love that picture. He's like, I feel like my life are these two horses. One loves decency and modesty and honor, and the other one is just wild, and I'm screaming at it, and I'm beating it with a whip, and it won't listen. I mean, it's fascinating. Is he reading any of your mail? He's reading my mail a little bit. Like, <laughs> and here's the thing. He's, both of them compare this battle to, to, to wild beasts that are difficult, hard, to control. So interesting. That's what Paul writes about. It's this part of the human condition to which Jesus has given us an answer. We are not hopeless as they were. We have this hope of overcoming this thing that we're dealing with. There's so many others. Henry David Thoreau talks about this animal within. Jonathan Haidt, he's a, a psychologist. He's an atheist. He's very popular right now. But he also talks about how there's like this animal inside of us that we try to control, but so difficult to control and move forward. The flesh, the flesh. This inward sinful bent towards self exalting myself, lifting myself, living for myself, pleasing myself, doing whatever myself wants. Now this plays out in two ways. There's a religious expression of the flesh, a religious expression of the flesh. This would be to say, uh, I know that I need to be right with God and I'm gonna make that happen myself. I'm gonna make that happen by being so good that God has to be good with me. So I'm gonna follow the rules and I'm gonna do all the stuff and I'm gonna be angry about the right stuff and I'm gonna be against all the right stuff and I, through my own effort, through my own religious exploits, by myself, on my own, I'm just gonna white knuckle it through life and be holy on my own so that God will be pleased with me. Do you see that? Is exalting myself above God. I don't need God 
I don't need Jesus to save me. I can save myself. There is a religious expression of the flesh. Be careful of that. You'll find that in a lot of churches. You might find that in a lot of people who say they are Christians, and you'll be able to point out, no, no, no. That's the flesh just as much as anything else. But there is also, and we're maybe more familiar with this, a very irreligious expression of the flesh. And that would be to say, I don't care about God. I don't need God. I'm going to live apart from God. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to be the king of my own life. I don't need Jesus to be the king of my life. I'm in charge. I'm in control. I'm going to live for myself. Do you see? In both expressions, the self is glorified. The self is exalted. The self sits on the throne. The self is the center of the universe, our flesh. And what you're going to discover is this, especially in Apostle Paul, that the ultimate expression of the flesh is found in a failure to love. The ultimate expression of the flesh is found in a failure to love, to love God on the one hand. I can rescue myself. I can save myself. I don't need Jesus and I'll be okay with God. I'm going to be so good that God owes me something, right? That's a failure to love God. And on the other side to say, I don't need God. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to do whatever makes me happy. I'm going to do whatever brings me pleasure. And I don't care how that affects anybody else that is living with no love for the other people in your life. I'm going to pursue my own pleasure at any cost, regardless of the effect on somebody else. The ultimate expression of the flesh is a failure to love God and to love others. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says this, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Now, these false prophets are coming into the church of Galatia, and they're starting to teach, you know, Paul, it really is, it's all about, you just got to get people to do all the right stuff on the outside. They need to be circumcised, and they need to not eat pork, and they, this is all the stuff they need to do, and that's what's going to make them good. And Paul, if you don't do that, guess what? They're all just going to go nuts and do whatever they want to. They're going to be like wild horses and elephants, right? So you got to keep them in control. So Paul says, don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, right? It doesn't mean just do whatever you want to do. He says, uh, then rather, so here's the opposite of indulging your flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. He, he seems to see that as the opposite of living for your flesh. Serve one another humbly in love for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command and that is love your neighbor as yourself. But here he lays it out for us. Don't just live in accordance with your flesh. Don't give yourself over to your own pleasure and whatever you want to do. Rather, serve others humbly Love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, he is drawing from something we find in the Old Testament, something that Jesus repeated, that the one command, all the commands can be summed up in this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Paul is like, if you don't want to give yourself over to the flesh, love God with all your heart and love others as you love yourself. And then he goes on to show us the ways that that our flesh and our passions and our own desires, if we just give ourselves over to that, he shows us all the ways that it hurts the other people in our lives. Look what he says, Galatians 5, verse 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And he lists this list. And I want to look at this list in, 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 in terms of the world that we live in now. You're going to find the world we live in now is not that different than the world that Paul lived in. But I want you to look at it in terms of our world. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Let's talk about hookup culture. Let's talk about this desire. I'm going to seek my own pleasure regardless of what it does to anybody else. Regardless of how I use people. Regardless of how I consume people. Regardless of how I've got to hurt people along the way to get whatever I want. And Paul says it, it hurts people for you to just give yourself over to your pleasures and your own desires without any thought of how it impacts others. There's a great book that was written in 2017 uh, 
The name of the author is slipping me right now. She's a great psychologist, but, but it's a book about hookup culture on college campuses. And in this book, she goes into detail through evidence-based research about how college students experience so much anxiety, pain, difficulty, even depression, because they feel like they are forced into living this way, even though they're like, we don't want to. But it's like the world has that much of a hold on those campuses and pushes people into situations they don't even want to be in just to fit in. And Paul is saying that is giving yourself over to the flesh without any care of how it hurts people or harms them. How people in a moment of, for a moment of temporary pleasure might do something that they've got to deal with for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I'm a pastor. I walk with people through those things. I walk with people through those things. So that's why I'm able to teach this not from a place of judgment, but from a place of love. Like, hey, if if something's happened, no condemnation. God gives grace and let's move forward in his love and in his grace. But also, hey, as someone who loves you, if I can help you avoid the pain that I've seen so many other people walk through, let me help you avoid it. Let me do it in love. Let me do it in grace. So Paul says these are what we see. Then he goes on. He talks about idolatry and witchcraft. These are the acts of the flesh. Idolatry and witchcraft. We see this even in churches in these days. I I see pastors preaching, I I think what we would call manifestation. And pastors saying, here's what you do. You just imagine something you want. Think about it nonstop. Just focus on it. Fixate on it. You know, have a vision for it. Like fixate on what you want, the house you want, the job you want, the car you want. And then keep fixating on it until it materializes in your life. I've heard pastors say this. That is idolatry, first of all, because it's saying fixate on something other than God all the time. And, and through sorcery, somehow make it happen in your life. You hear someone saying stuff like that, you run. You're not going to hear me say it, but if you hear someone on YouTube, you hear someone on TV saying stuff like that, you turn it off. That's what it is. It is idolatry. It is witchcraft. And it's going to leave you, it's going to leave you feeling like God is somehow holding out on you. It's going to leave you feeling like God is some kind of vending machine where you're supposed to go and walk through this sequence of things and he's supposed to give you what you want that is not how it works to sit under the rule and reign of a magnificent king. Amen? All right, I gotta get going here. What else do we got? (laughs) So, talk about social media, the world we live in with cancel culture, the way people talk to each other on Facebook, on Twitter. What does Paul say? Here are some more activities of the flesh. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. He talks about envy there. Let's look at our current political system and the way that people live. Look what it says. Selfish ambition, dissension, factions separating people for the sake of someone else's own good, using people's division for the sake of my own moving forward and moving up the ladder. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Paul says this is what marks out a people who are living according to the flesh, who give themselves over to whatever they want without any regard for God, or for other people. Then, then, conversely, look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You tell me, you tell me, which world would you rather live in? You tell me which city do you want to live in? Which community do you want to belong to? A community where people are looking out for each other and serving the Lord and living with love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness. Oh my God, what a world that would be. And that's what we're called to. These virtues embody the character of Jesus. This is who he has called us to be. And when we embody the character of Jesus, we recognize that his life was ruled and governed by his ultimate desire to please the Father. 
And so Jesus is able to live a sinless life. Jesus is able to withstand temptation. Jesus is able to avoid living for his own passions or desires or being swayed by those things because ultimately he's governed and ruled by his desire to please the Father. And that's what we find. That's what we find. John Mark Comer writes in his book, Live No Lies, about how Often, this battle that we have between the flesh and the spirit of God within us is a battle of disordered desires. Disordered desires. Because what you want is how you will walk. What you desire determines your decisions. And what we do to walk by the spirit is simply to say, Lord, through your spirit at work within me, change my desires. Like, here's the thing that sometimes we don't admit, whatever it might be, if it's a habit, if it's an addiction, if it's something you're walking through that you know is not pleasing to God and does not love and live for the greatest good of the other people in your life, what we miss is sometimes we we don't want to admit we do those things because we like doing those things. And, 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 and maybe in our prayer time, it's like, Lord, you know, the devil is just attacking me all the time. I'm just this helpless person. I can't even do anything. And, and sometimes I got to get people to admit, you have to admit you like it. And, and at this moment, your desire for that thing is greater than your desire to live for and honor and please the Lord. It is. So we pray. First, we confess. God, reveal to me the things in my life that are not in accordance with your word, in accordance with your plan, the ways that I'm giving myself over to my flesh rather than living for the spirit at work in me and walking with him. And then, and then we ask God to change, to transform our desires. And we find that in the scripture. We find in the scripture that he does that. That's why it's so powerful that he has promised us the spirit. It's powerful. We find this throughout the Old Testament. That he promises that he's going to rescue you. He promises that he has a way to save you through the the death, the burial, the resurrection of his son on the cross. He's going to save you. But not only that, when you receive Christ, he's going to give you his spirit living in you. And look what his spirit in us does. Philippians 2 verse 12. This is again Paul. And he says, therefore, my beloved... As you've always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. He's writing to a church where he's gone away. And he's like, I've seen you going after the Lord. I've seen you living to honor him when I was there. You got to do it even more now that I'm away. And what does he say? Work out your salvation. It doesn't say work for your salvation. Don't work to earn your salvation. You cannot earn it. It is a gift of God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But you have to work on it. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God, this is so important, it is God who works in you, his spirit at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do you see that? That the spirit of God can work in you to change what you will for, to change what you desire to reorder your desires in a way that honors God. The Spirit of God is working in you to change your desires so that you desire what God wants more than what your flesh wants and also to work for it, to do the stuff you've got to do in order to live for the Lord. So the Spirit of God changes you. The Spirit of God transforms you, but also the Spirit of God is working in you throughout this whole journey of sanctification. On those days when it's hard. On those days when you will mess up because you will mess up. On those days where you struggle, the Spirit of God is at work. Ask the Spirit of God to help you. If you have a desire to change, if you have a desire to stop walking with the flesh and start walking with the Spirit, ask the Spirit of God. His Spirit is a loving Spirit. His Spirit guides you. His Spirit speaks to you. His Spirit strengthens you. His Spirit enables you. His Spirit changes even what you desire. So how do we do this? Like, how do we do this? Practically, how do we live this out in our lives? The first thing is this, and like I said, it's it's walking with the Spirit. Like, you have a responsibility in this too. So there's a huge part of it that God does, absolutely, but every time you 
Walk in the Spirit. Every time you obey the leading of the Spirit, every time you do what God wants you to do in opposition to what your flesh wants to do, every time you do that, you, you are growing those muscles. You are strengthening those muscles that help you to honor God and to love others well. You're strengthening those muscles. That's why fasting is so powerful. You know, we came out of the season of, of three weeks of prayer and fasting. When you are fasting, what you are doing is you are, in a sense, subduing. You're practicing what it is to subdue your flesh. Like if you practice social media, right? In a world that says, hey, you're going to be addicted to social media. You're going to be on your phone 24-7. Like we've, we've got the best people in the world working on that to make sure that you are attached on that phone all day long. When you say for three weeks, I'm not going to do that. Do you see what I'm saying? You are subduing your flesh. You are teaching your flesh that it does not need something that you feel like you need. And when you do that, those muscles grow. Those muscles get stronger. And in a contrary way, whenever you quench the spirit, whenever the spirit of God is leading you, whenever the spirit of God is, is whispering to you, hey, don't go down that road. Don't have that conversation. Don't, don't let that relationship get out of control because it's going to take you to a bad place. You do not want to blow up your life over this. When the Spirit of God is leading you and you ignore His Spirit, when you do it anyway, when you don't care, when you choose your flesh over the Spirit of God, you quench the Spirit. And the more you do that, those muscles get weaker. They get weaker. You will not hear His voice as clearly it will not be as easy to obey. It will not be as easy to follow. So let, let those, those spirit muscles get stronger in your life. Follow the spirit as often as you can. Amen? I, uh, you know, over the years I've tried so many different things to take control of my health and just be a little bit more intentional about that. None of them worked. So <laughs> a couple months ago, I started actually working out with somebody. Like I knew I needed that accountability. His name's Jason, because I only trust people named Jason. And you also should only trust people named Jason. So when I go work out with Jason, like, man, Jason like pushes me, right? Pushes me more than like I would. I, so places where I would naturally be like, man, I can't do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to stop here. Jason always pushes me to go a little bit further, but he's not just pushing me, right? He's helping me. I mean, he's spotting me. And so when we first start working out together, hey, he spotted me a lot. And I can tell he spotted me a lot, right? Because he's like, oh, okay, man, this is really bad. Okay, whatever. <laughs> but now over time, after a couple months, and I've been doing this for a couple months, like I, obviously you could tell, right? I assume you could tell. <laughs> if you can't tell, I'll pray for the Lord to heal your blindness, okay? But <laughs> we've been doing this for a while, and now after a few months, like there's a lot of times where for some reason he's surprised by this, but he's like, bro, you did that all on your own, right? Like you did that yourself. That was you. You're actually getting stronger, right? And that is often how the Spirit works in our life. It's by walking with the Spirit that we sense and hear his voice more. It's by obeying the leadings of the Spirit that we are able to do what he calls us to do even more. It's, it's the hardest thing about being a pastor because there are so many areas of our sanctification and our becoming more like Jesus where I've got to tell you, you won't get this until you do it. And you look around the room and you ask the people who are doing it and they'll be like, yeah, he's right, he's right, he's right. Like if you do it, it works. But until you do it, you won't experience it. Until you do it, you won't get it. And, and that's what I want for you. That's what I want for you. So we obey the spirit. We follow his lead. And maybe you're asking, gosh, Jason, I think it's too late for me. I think my life is already too far off track. I don't know if I can get there. Look what Paul teaches these Galatians because they're struggling with it. They're like, this is so hard. How are we going to do this? And Paul teaches them that it is the same spirit that saves us, which also sanctifies us. The spirit that saves us is a spirit that sanctifies us. They're trying so hard to follow all the rules and get everything right and do all the stuff and they're struggling. And this is what he says to them in Galatians 3. Pay attention to this. You foolish Galatians. You foolish new lifers. I'm kidding. But he says, you foolish Galatians. 
Who has bewitched you? Like, who's leading you off track? Who's convincing you of anything other than the truth? He says, before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Here's what he's saying. How did God redeem, rescue, and regenerate your soul? You believed in Jesus, that he was crucified, that he died for you, that he took your sins upon himself, and that when you trust in him, you could be made new. You believed in him, and the Holy Spirit regenerated your heart. The Holy Spirit worked in you. The Holy Spirit made you new. The Holy Spirit even led you into that belief. And he's like, why are you now trying to do this on your own? The same spirit that saved you is the spirit that will sanctify you. The same spirit that saved you is the spirit that is going to walk with you through your daily struggles, through your daily attempts to do what God is calling you to do, through your daily journey of looking to be who God has called you to be and to be more like Jesus, through your daily journey of battling your flesh, through your daily journey of battling the the pleasures that you might seek after on your own. The spirit is going to be with you. And he's going to strengthen you and he's going to change your desires and he will always help you to know and remember your father who loves you. Because look at what he says there. You've got to focus on Christ crucified. You saw him, you believed, it was clearly portrayed to you. Jesus crucified for you, what does that show you? It shows you the magnificent, unbelievable love of God for you. That's where all this starts. Living to please him and love others, it all starts with recognizing how much God loved you. That he sent his own son for you. That he desired to be with you and have a relationship with you so badly that he would give what was most precious to him in order to win you back to himself. There is nothing that you desire in this world that even comes close to comparing to him. His love for you, his grace poured out over you. And so he says, look to the cross. Hey, on days that are hard, just look to the cross and remember that Jesus loves you. On days that are good, when you are walking with the Spirit and enjoying the power of the Spirit made manifest in your life, look to the cross and remember that Jesus has given you that promise and made it possible for you to experience that gift in your life. Always look to the cross. When the enemy starts to whisper guilt and condemnation and shame into your life, look to the cross. And you say, I, I don't need to listen to those whispers. I don't need to be led astray. Look what God did for me, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to choose him. He's more than enough. He's more than enough. Amen? Here's why this is a big deal. Here's why this is a big deal. Simple thing, but this truly comes from my heart. You got to remember, every cause has an effect. Every cause has an effect. Every decision you make, everything you do, Every cause has an effect. And the second thing is this, the effect is often disproportionate to the cause. And again, as your pastor who loves you, some of you, there are some things that seem like they are small things. Decisions, choices that seem like they are small and insignificant things. And some of you, I fear, might be one tiny decision away from blowing up your life from wrecking your family, from ruining your marriage, from messing up your future, from messing up your future with a person maybe you haven't even met yet. And I'm saying, don't walk with the flesh, walk with the spirit, love God well, love others well, and live the flourishing, thriving, beautiful life that God has invited you into. Take this seriously and walk with him. But remember the reason for it all. Jesus gave himself for you.